This program is a production of the Panoply Network, a subsidiary of Pizza Plea Media. Welcome to Whatever Happened to Pizza at McDonald's, the investigative journalism program where I ask the question, whatever happened to the pizza at McDonald's? I'm your host, Brian Thompson. Today, I find myself thinking about my legacy. As you may have heard in the corporate news, the head of News Corporation, Mr. Rupert Murdoch, has decided to step down from his position after a short 97 years of running the company. And while it would make sense to replace him with an internal employee who has worked their way up through the ranks by showing an invaluable combination of competence, loyalty, and vision, Mr. Murdoch will instead be passing the company on to his son, Lachlan Murdoch. I wish them both well in their future endeavors, whether they be running a media empire based on digging through British celebrities' garbage cans, or retiring to a comfortable cottage nestled among the pine trees of the exclusive Bohemian Grove Resort, where the elderly and powerful can peacefully urinate upon one another in the shadow of the massive owl statues to which they make human sacrifices. But now I am left wondering, to whom will I leave my company, Pizza Plea Media? its wholly owned subsidiary, the Panoply Network, and all the other business endeavors spawned by my massively popular and borderline profitable investigative journalism efforts. I do intend to find an apprentice to train in the journalistic arts as soon as I can remember the password to my ZipRecruiter account. But when it comes to managing my ongoing business affairs, I am afraid they're currently are not any viable candidates. I am both the CEO and the sole employee of Pizza Plea Media, which poses a couple of challenges. One is that negotiations between the Pizza Plea Union and Pizza Plea Management often end in a stalemate. Another is that there is no one at the company I might promote to CEO upon my retirement. I would pass the company on to my progeny like Mr. Murdoch has done, but the only problem with this plan is that I have no progeny. Due to how busy I am and other personal reasons, I have not conceived a child, even though despite some rather mean-spirited accusations from various of my classmates over the years, I do in fact know how a child is conceived. The details are outside the scope of this program, but by way of evidence, I will say it has something to do with falling in love, sperms, etc. But there is another method for the creation of offspring that does not involve the time or fluid commitment of the traditional method, a biological technology called cloning. While cloning has been possible for some time, it is still a relatively frowned-upon procedure. In part, this is because popular entertainment has tended to portray clones in a negative light, perhaps most notably in the work of George Lucas, who is largely responsible for the widespread misconception that clones are prone to attack. There are also ethical concerns, as it is questionable whether a clone contains within it the kind of spiritual core or soul that an organism created through more traditional biological processes might possess. Perhaps because of these concerns, there are currently no viable companies engaging in human cloning. For many years, a company called Clone Aid claimed to be able to produce human clones for just $200,000 per clone, but these claims have largely been discredited on account of CloneAid has never been able to prove through DNA evidence that they have ever successfully created a human clone, and also because they are owned and operated by a somewhat deranged UFO cult. However, the business of animal cloning is metaphorically booming. Noted singer, actor, director, 
and male yeshiva student impersonator Barbara Streisand owns two clones of her deceased pet dog, Samantha. And the recent motion picture Homeward Bound 3, Still Looking for Home, went through nearly a gross of cloned golden retrievers until they finally got a clean shot of one of them swimming across a river. If animals can be cloned, there is no technical reason why a human could not. Humans are, after all, a type of animal. We just happen to be the favorite animal of the god-god, Ben David. I am loath to deceive any reputable cloning business, but if a series of mix-ups, misunderstandings, or mislabeled shipping labels resulted in them receiving, for example, some of my own DNA instead of my pet's, and they use it to create what they believe to be a clone of a cat or dog, but is actually a clone of myself that I might one day use as an heir, then I don't think modern ethical standards will allow them to do anything other than remit said clone into my custody as soon as it bursts forth from its gestation pod. But just to make sure, I decided to call upon a pet cloning company to ask some relevant questions. Thanks for calling. Hello, my name is Brian Thompson. I was calling with a couple of questions about your cloning service. Of course, yeah. How can we help? Well, I was thinking about cloning an animal, and I was wondering how much genetic material from said animal do you need to create the clone? Yeah, if the samples are being collected from a living pet, then we would ask for a total of four biopsy samples be collected, and each of those biopsy samples would be four millimeters in size. Okay, four millimeter bi. And what does a biopsy entail? Uh, it's a skin biopsy sample. Um, so it is since it's a rather small sample, most veterinarians are comfortable collecting it with just a local anesthetic. Um, and then they'll usually close it up with a suture or two. Okay, so um, let's say that I didn't have access to a a veterinarian. Uh, Is this something that I could do at home with maybe just rubbing the area with an ice pack or something like that to facilitate comfort? Unfortunately not. This is something that would need to be done by a veterinarian. Oh, okay, okay. Um, Hmm. What if I was able to find a human doctor that had experience with this particular kind of animal? Um, possibly. Um, from our experience, we do recommend a licensed veterinarian take the samples. Okay. Okay. Well, that does make sense. Um, another question I had, and, and pardon me, maybe I'm just ignorant about the process, but I was wondering about, um, any sort of cross-contamination of genetic material. I, I know that you know, there are sort of living organisms all around us, bacteria, et cetera. If, if I provided a sample and let's say that there was a, a bacterium or something in the sample or, or in the envelope or, or on the box or something like that, and the creature that you created from the cloning process turned out not to be the same animal that I wanted cloned, is that something that can happen? Um, no, we haven't had that experience happen. When you submit samples, um, you'll also submit a cheek swab sample to UC Davis and to their veterinary genetics lab, and they'll do um, a genetic marker report. That's essentially the DNA fingerprint of your pet, and then we'll just keep that on file. And then once the clone puppy or kitten is born, um, that same cheek swab process is done and sent to UC Davis, and they will then confirm that um, the puppy or kitten is genetically identical using that um, original swab that was taken when the samples were collected. Okay. Okay, well, that does give me some peace of mind. Um, and, and also, um, you know, let's say there is an accident and the creature that forms in the cloning tube or wherever it's grown uh, is something sort of not what you expected. Ethically, um, how do you dispose of or do you dispose of, of these creatures? Or do you just let them grow to fruition, I guess is the word. Would, yeah, so, um, the, so the, is this a puppy or a kitten that we would be doing? Um, I'm not really sure right now. 
Okay. Um, so let's just say um, hypothetically that this is the puppy. Um, so the, the embryos that we create would be transferred to a surrogate mom. And then any puppy that is born from her, you know, if the puppy is not, you know, 100% healthy, we would certainly evaluate the puppy just to see if he or she is suffering at all. If that puppy were happening to be suffering, then we would do humane euthanasia. Okay, just sort of humanely destroy the puppy. Okay, well, that actually, that's very enlightening. I, I was under the impression, perhaps from various you know, science fiction stories or things like that, that the, the clone would be grown inside some sort of a glass tube, some like in a, a solution of liquid, maybe with some bubbles. But it's inside of a womb of, a, of another animal? Correct, that's right. Um, it would be inside the same species that we're cloning. So for a dog, it, it would be inside a, uh, another dog. Okay, so if it were a person, it would be inside another person. Okay. Um, well, that does complicate things. Um, I just had one more question, and this is, I, I'm sorry if it might sound a little bit unusual or esoteric, but whenever a clone is made of, let's say, a puppy, um, does the owner report noticing anything different about the clone's personality compared to the the original? I guess what I'm getting at is, is if you believe that dogs have souls, do you think that the clone has a soul of, of any sort of similar type? Uh, yeah, so the feedback we often get is that the personality is, you know, similar and of a similar temperament, but at the end of the day, they are still their own unique individual with their own unique personality traits. Okay, but certain things are passed on, let's say, like skills. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that personality and temperament wise do tend to be genetic. So there you know, we do see, you know, those things kind of um, you know, carried down, so to speak, in, in the um cloning process is the genetics are the same. Okay. Well, let's say it was like sort of a, let's say a bloodhound that uh, that is used by investigators to investigate things. Do you think that the clone would be able to do just as good a job at investigating? Um, it would depend just because a lot of that, you know, did, there is a lot of that that's genetic, but at the same time, a lot of that is training based too. So the clone dog would also have to go through that rigorous training as well, um, just to be, you know, have that same qualification that the original dog did. Okay. Okay. Well, you've answered a lot of my questions. I want to thank you for your candor. Um, I, I guess uh, just to close out, um, what sort of price range are we talking about for this procedure? Yeah. So to preserve the DNA um, for a cat, dog, and horse, that fee is 1600 And then for the cloning process, um, for cats and dogs, the fee is 50000 So $50,000? Correct. Mm-hmm. Plus sixteen hundred for the genetic material uh, times the value of a human. Okay. Well, I will uh, budget this and see what I am able to come up with finance wise. Um, again, thank you very much for for answering my questions. You've been very helpful. Okay, no problem at all. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Do you know what happened to pizza at McDonald's? Do you remember it? please send all correspondence to pizza at mcdonald's at gmail.com. To support the show, please join my Patreon at patreon.com slash pizza at mcd's for exclusive benefits. And for more information, including links to social media, merchandise opportunities, etc., visit pizza at mcdonald's.com. Thank you to my invaluable Patreon producers. Trisha Yates, Trisha Yates, Adam Crump, Dan Dreyer, David Friedman, Grant Bacon, Jacob Ford, Joe Kajic, Kimberly King, Kyle Turok, Nicole Besta, Pam Gabriel, Polly Egan, Wesley, Will, Andrew Duffy, Andrew Ahmed Rubin, Billy Jean, Brad Allen Thompson, Gerald Lewis, J. Poop, Calvin Thomas, Can You Fly Bobby, Laurel Paul, 
Mel, Mitchell Kordick, Opus Moreshi, Paul Fu, and Ryan Guggenmoss. I'm Brian Thompson, investigative journalist.